Hello everyone, Kevin from TechSelect here. Today I have a quick video on the Super Nintendo adapter we made for use with the 8-Bit Guy's new game, Attack of the Petsky Robots. David originally designed the game on the Commodore PET, and he'd used Super Nintendo controllers a few times on other Commodore projects. It also seems like there have been very few options to support a controller of any sort on the Commodore PET, so we decided to make one. He asked us not only to make a PET to SNES adapter, but to make it as universal across as many machines as possible. The Super Nintendo controller contains two shift register ICs internally. The circuit will simply send the status of the 16 inputs serially when latched and clocked accordingly. Only 12 of the 16 available inputs are used in the Super Nintendo controller and can be easily read from a short software routine. This circuit will require three I.O. pins from the Commodore, as well as a voltage source and a ground. We started by looking at the Commodore 64 user port as we expected it would be the primary platform for the game. We also compared the user ports of the VIC-20, the PET, as well as the PLUS-4 and several other systems. Three data pins were needed, and fortunately we were able to locate three pins which were in common across all of the systems we were targeting. And there they are. Okay, well it may look a little odd, but it will make more sense in a minute. It's beyond the scope of this video, but you would only really need to set the latch pin, then pulse the clock pin low than high 16 times. Each time you did this, one bit of the data would be available on the data output. Here's a picture showing the data pins as well as the actual power connections. The plus 5 volt connection is on pin 2, and one or all of the grounds may be used, but at least one needs to be connected to the ground. This is the pinout of the Commodore PET user port. Every space marked with orange is actually different from the Commodore 64 user port. Initially, this may seem like a problem, but actually most of the data pins still line up, albeit in a different port number. However, there is one issue which has been a problem for many projects on the PET in the past. Most PET machines do not provide any power to the user port. To make matters worse, it would seem that even if a PET does provide power, it is shared with the video composite output. It's not unheard of to mix AC and DC signals on the same line, but trying to keep the adapter part count low presented an issue. I'm jumping ahead a bit, so we'll circle back here in a minute. The Commodore Plus 4 was originally planned to have a port of the game, but it's been shelved for the time being. However, if it ever is revived, the adapter is already designed to work correctly on it. Again, you can see all the differences in the pinout from the Commodore 64, but fortunately this time the power pins are present and in the same location. There are exactly three data pins which map that are also usable on other Commodore user ports. It was really fortunate that it worked out this way, otherwise we would not have been able to make the adapter work on all of these systems at once. It's also why I didn't use something like port PB0, PB1, and PB2 on the Commodore 64, which at first glance would make sense, but after you see how it maps on the Plus 4, it's why we chose the pins that we ultimately did. So back to the PET video pin. While researching various board revisions for the PET, it seems that most of all of them will output composite video on pin 2. I thought some of the newer systems, like the 4000 series, were supplying power, and the 2000 series were not on this pin, but that turned out not to be true all of the time. Some 2000s do seem to provide power, and I've already heard of at least one 4032, which didn't. We sent the adapters out to several folks to test and decided that an external power option was going to be needed for some systems. At the end of the day, you probably won't know for sure if your pet's providing power without just trying it. A single diode is in place to protect the video pin from any DC input, and ideally to drop enough voltage to mostly consume the video signal. In most cases this seems to work, but a few systems may fail to show video or maybe have video glitches. If you're using a pet and having a video issue or the controller is not working, then you'll probably need to provide external power. The bottom of the adapter has a jumper labeled J1. By default, the jumper is connected to pin 1 and pin 2 of this connector. This connects the user port directly to the power pin of the Super Nintendo controller. If you need to provide external power, it can be done in one of two ways. First, remove the jumper and store it away for use on other systems. The center pin is labeled plus 5V and you can provide power from the cassette port. This is common for other third-party products such as the SD to IAC which need power from the system. You can also provide power from an external source like a USB adapter or a 5 volt wall ward. Pin 3 on J1 is a ground, so it will also need to be connected if an external power source is used.
The last feature of the adapter is the rather conspicuous audio jack. This connector is only meant for the pet, however, and will not make sound on the other systems at this time. The audio connection is wired the same as used by other games on the Commodore PET, such as Space Invaders. Early pets had no internal speakers, so this mod is often performed already. But if you don't have it done, you have a handy audio jack to plug in amplified speakers. This port is mono, but wired for a stereo jack. I had a few questions about whether or not wireless SNES controllers can be used with the adapter, and at this point I believe a couple of different brands have been tested, but there's really no guarantee that all controllers will work. The real intent was to use them with the stock controller, and others may require external power even if your system is providing it depending on their current draw. We know that there were other SNES adapter options available, but this one really had two goals, which was to be low cost and universal. We did meet these goals, but that means that at this point there's really only one compatible game with this adapter, and that's Attack of the Petsky Robots. And while it only works with Attack of the Petsky Robots right now, over time we feel that others might use this for their games as well and give it a little bit more life. It is a little difficult to uh, unplug this adapter as well, so sorry about that, but just not too many adapters available to fit the user port these days. Well, that about wraps up this video for today, and I really appreciate you taking the time to watch, and I hope you learned something about the adapter for the Attack of the Petsky Robots. And I just wanted to add on a personal note that while editing this video today, I just happened to take a look and saw that we hit 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. I'm really thankful to our subscribers, as well as our customers. We really appreciate your support, and we plan to keep building more cool stuff for the retro computing scene. We're really happy to be part of the Commander X16 project as well, and I plan a small update video sometime soon to show some of the small changes that we've made recently, so stay tuned for that. To end the video, here's a montage of us putting together the Attack of the Petsky Robot Adapters. Thanks for watching. Thank you.